Um, our community of practice. So the Rewilding Community of Practice aims to connect practitioners, landowners, scientists, and rewild enthusiasts from the diverse cultural, geographical, and professional backgrounds. We are a volunteer-led group of people from all over the world uh, working under the umbrella of the Global Landscapes Forum. And uh, yes, some of us have years of experience in nature conservation and rewilding, and others are coming from a variety of non-scientific uh, backgrounds. So we're very open-minded and our main kind of thing is that we want you to be enthusiastic about rewilding as a nature-based solution. Um, yeah, and uh, well, as I said, we're a global group and uh, one of our members, Jonas, you can put the next slide, thank you. One of our members uh, is Purnima Devi Um, So she is the founder of the Hargila Army as well as the senior project manager of the Abhi Fauna Research and Conservation Division in Aranyak. Um, she's based in India, and today she was awarded a very important prize from the UN. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, so yeah, it's the um, UNEP Champions of the Earth Award, and it's the UN's highest environmental honor. Uh, and it was given to our dear friend and colleague Purnima for her conservation efforts of the Greater Ajudan Stock in Assam, India. So congratulations, Purnima, and thank you for joining today, despite all your high profile work. So thank you so much. Round. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Rewilding Academy and Rewilding Corp. So thank you so much for all your support. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, right. To the agenda, um, we'll have an yeah, we'll have three presentations, starting with David Satori, who is the founder of Rewilding Mycology. And he will be followed by Michael Hathaway, who is a professor at the Matsutake World Research Group and Simon Fraser University. So for you who do not know, Matsutake is a very particular type of mushroom. I am sure Michael will tell you more about it in a moment. And um, finally, our last presentation will be by Bethan Manley, who's a program manager uh, of global data science at SPUN, uh, which is a network that maps underground mycorrhizal networks. Um, yeah, and finally, we'll have a moderated discussion, Q&A, followed by a small breakout, breakout session of 15 minutes where you can use your time to network with everyone. So yeah. I'm, um, yeah, we can now move on to the Zoom poll. Um, so we'll have a few questions to prep you for today's event. Okay, so the first question is, what brought you here today? Is it rewilding? Is it fungi? Is it both? Or are you just a mushroom philic person? Our second question is, do you work directly with fungi? And ooh, seems to be an equal. Some say yes, some say no. Also some mushroom cooks here. Incidentally, I had a bit of a mushroom risotto just before joining today's event. Okay, we've had 79 people answer. 80, okay. They're waiting for a few people. Okay, so lots of you are interested in rewilding and fungi. That's great because that's why we're here today. So essentially what we want to answer today is how can, um, how can mushrooms and fungi essentially help conservation efforts, but also how can we build a conservation effort that prioritizes fungi and uh, yeah, make sure it's mycologically inclusive? Um, so yeah, is there anyone else who hasn't answered the poll? No, I think everyone that wanted to answer has answered. Fantastic. 
So it seems like most of you don't work directly with fungi, but that doesn't come as a surprise given uh, fungi have been long ignored in mainstream ecological discourse and only recently have had a sort of yeah, uh, renaissance and um, yeah, there's a bit, been a big interest. We've had fantastic fungi documentaries. We've had books about the fungi kingdom, uh, one of which is very famous by Merlin Sheldrake. Um, I know Bethan has worked with him, uh, so she'll maybe be able to elaborate on that. Um, yeah, so I think we'll close the poll now. Thank you very much for everyone ha who has participated. And we can just get started uh, with the presentations. So I'll just introduce uh, David first. Yeah, are we ready? Okay. Yes, so David Satori is the founder of Rewilding Mycology, and as such, he's one of the biggest authorities of the intersection of rewilding and the fungi kingdom. So he's very well positioned to introduce the field to you and provide a kind of bird's eye view on this topic. So thank you, David. On to you. Thank you for being here today, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Great. The pleasure's all mine. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. Great. Let me see if I could share the screen. One sec. All right. How's that? Great. So hello, everyone. So it's it's a pleasure to get the chance to speak to you all today. And I'm really pleased to see such a great turnout for the event. Um, and I think what this speaks to is the, the growing appreciation that we have for the importance of fungi in the natural world, as well as uh, an increase in the interest for more holistic approaches to uh, wildlife conservation and better ways of relating with nature, which uh, rewilding itself represents. Uh, but to me, rewilding also symbolizes the hope that we may start to reverse the decline of biodiversity. And as a mycologist, I see the opportunity for rewilding to play a massive role in the, in the future of fungal conservation. So I'll start off today by taking you somewhere perhaps very far away from where you're listening to um, this talk from right now. Um, imagine yourselves in the grasslands of the Serengeti National Park, where large herds of wildebeest, zebra and gazelles roam among the lions and the leopards. Under the heat of the Tanzanian sun, this landscape sustains the largest herds of migratory uh, herbivores and the greatest conservation uh, concentration of large predators in the world. Now, as the herbivores graze these extensive grasslands, the nutrients that originated in the soil and transmuted into plants are incorporated into the bodies of the animals themselves. Now, bridging the gap between the soil and the plants are the mycorrhizal fungi that help plants acquire nutrients that would have been otherwise inaccessible to the plants themselves. Now, they can be responsible for providing grasses as much as 90% of the phosphorus intake, and this results in vegetation that, is, that has better growth and greater nutritional content. Now here's where the, things get interesting. This enhanced nutritional quality ripples through the ecosystem, cascading up the food web and concentrates into the animals themselves. So tracking the flow of these nutrients, we find that mycorrhizal fungi account for one half of the biomass of the herbivores and one third of the biomass of the, the predators. So let that sink in for a moment. Despite representing less than 1% of the total biomass of the ecosystem, mycorrhizal fungi help generate the incredible carrying capacity of one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. And without them, this ecosystem would be a fraction of what it is today. So fungi are central to the function of terrestrial ecosystems across the planet, carrying out a diverse array of ecological processes upon which countless other life forms depend. The decomposers provide fertility by liberating nutrients from dead organic matter um, and heart rot fungi such as this chicken of the woods fungus hollow out old heavy trees that improve their stability against storms for example. Uh, mycorrhiza increase plants access to nutrients, improve their growth um, and sequester carbon and lichens, the ultimate example of symbiotic mutualism, dissolve rock over, over millennia that contribute to the first soils in an ecosystem and species such as this Labaria pulmonaria are important indicator species for temperate rainforest ecosystems such as those that we see on the west coast of Scotland. And finally, endophytes, which live within plant tissues, provide defense against all sorts of pathogens. 
Now, until recently, rewilding has focused largely on working with highly visible species, predominantly animals, whose effects can be monitored from our above ground vantage points. And for good reason, too. Uh, we know the sweeping impact that top down trophic cascades can have on an entire ecosystem, with the classic example of uh, the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone National Park, demonstrating how predators can help restore forests and rivers. Now, fungi, in contrast, remain hidden from view, growing vegetatively through opaque substrates such as soil and wood, but their influence over global nutrient cycles, ecological succession, and resilience tells us that the full impact of rewilding can't be understood with a focus on plants and animals alone. In other words, we have to look deeper into the effects that rewilding is having. Without monitoring the fungal response to rewilding, we're overlooking perhaps the best option that we have for restoring fungal diversity. So here's an, an example of that at play. So many small mammals dig around and eat fungi and disperse their spur, uh, spores through their feces. One study from Australia found uh, that looked at the impact of native mammal reintroductions found that it promoted mycorrhizal spore abundance, species richness and diversity, which led to increased mycorrhization of rainforest soils. Another study found that fungal communities were drastically different in soils with exotic versus native reintroduced mammals, suggesting that a loss of native mammals can actually lead to a co-extinction of fungal diversity. Um, and what these studies imply essentially is that rewilding may begin to piece together some of these lost fungal interactions. So people can be excused for thinking that fungal diversity isn't under threat. From our above ground vantage points, uh, we're left with an incomplete picture of what's actually happening underground in the soil. Now, anyone paying attention to the media right now being generated around fungi will hear of how fungi can, you know, clean up oil spills and absorb radiation and be molded into different materials uh, to replace plastics. But behind this appearance of resilience, we have a kingdom of life that's facing dramatic declines in virtually every ecosystem that's studied. As, for example, the remaining ancient trees in our landscape um, come, to the, come to the end of their lives, there's a lack of recruitment from younger generations of trees to lifeboat many of the rare threatened wood decay species, such as this Heresium corolloides. Um, for example, excessive fertilizer loads combined with air pollution is unraveling many of the mycorrhizal partnerships, causing alarming declines in mushroom production and mycelial extent underground that has been noted since the 1980s. And finally, reseeding pastures with commercial grasses is afflicting sensitive species of grass and fungi, such as wax caps. And I think it's fair to say that the decline of ancient wax cap grasslands has gone in lockstep with the decline of flower rich meadows in the UK, except it doesn't get as much publicity as the other uh, flower rich meadow ecosystem. And dare I say it, even rewilding itself may be threatening fungal diversity as far as tree planting is concerned, at least. Um, in post-Brexit Britain, we're seeing more landos, landowners now switching from sheep farming to carbon offset tree planting, and ancient grasslands are sometimes a target for that. So the overgrazed hill pastures of places such as the Pennines in the north of England are a global biodiversity hotspot for wax caps, coral fungi, pink gills, and earth tongues, making these areas internationally important for their conservation value. All too often, these habitats are seen as neglected, cheaply valued, degraded, and easy to plant trees on, and the shortage of mycologists represented among the decision makers means that the important fungi of these ecosystems get overlooked, despite the fact that tightly grazed grasslands surely would have been a part of our prehistoric landscape, maintained by herds of wild horses, for example. So over the last three decades or so, Mycologists have compiled red lists, biodiversity action plans, lists of fungi that are indicators of important habitats, all for the purposes of advancing legal protection measures for fungi in the UK. Now, despite some of our most diligent efforts to record, monitor and understand these species, in the decades that have elapsed, very little has changed to improve the status of some of our most vulnerable species, not all. We have seen some incredible comebacks, um, but all of this is taken against the backdrop of accelerating habitat loss, and we really need to do something about that. So as conservationists, the first line of action that we take is to better understand the distribution, the habitat requirements, the threats, and the population trends of the species that we're working with. And this means mobilizing field mycologists to re record and monitor uh, species in their habitats. 
but with poor funding, declined since the 1970s, and nowhere near enough mycologists to keep up with the demand, these efforts usually result in pleas for more research to be done. So I commend all of the mycologists who have spent years, if not decades, of their life generating large volumes of data of which lays the foundation for practical conservation. And by all means, we definitely need to continue doing so to improve our understanding of fungal habitat requirements. Um, but we do have to start developing practical strategies and implementing these um, for reversing fungal decline, even if that knowledge base isn't perfect just yet. So in other words, the way I see fungal conservation developing is that we need two parallel strategies, one focused on data gathering and the other focused on practical implementation. Um, and this is where rewilding kicks in, especially when, when it comes from a PR, um, PR standpoint. So in terms of how do we engage the public, um, that fungal conservation and rewilding and the hybrid of the two is a very important thing. So. Rewilding itself places the emphasis less on conserving individual species, typically within small and fragmented habitats, and more on restoring habitat connectivity and natural processes across the entire food web. Now, this is crucial because rewilding is full of experience and expertise in habitat restoration, but mycologists are rarely part of the team of wildlife consultants that help influence their approach. And that's exactly the mission that drives me for what I do with rewilding mycology. Um, so to advance fungal conservation, step one is to start monitoring fungi within rewilding projects, which will help us improve our understanding of fungal habitat requirements, expand the available habitat sites for fungi, and then also to support other aspects of wildlife, um, especially in terms of things like cavity creation within large trees that attracts different forms of wildlife, whether that's cavity nesting birds or bats or mice or ants or social bees, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and credit goes here as well to Alan Watson Featherstone, who's here with us today uh, for this for taking this picture just a few weeks ago up in Glen Affric in the Scottish Islands. So, in other words, we need to go beyond flora and fa uh, fauna, and we need to start encompassing fungi into our language, into our landscapes, giving fungi explicit prominence as essential components of biodiversity. So, the flora fauna fungi approach is making headway in the UK. Um, last year, I conducted a fungal baseline biodiversity assessment uh, for the Natural Capital Laboratory, which is a rewilding project nested in the Scottish Highlands uh, near Loch Ness, which Alan Watson Featherstone again helped to initiate. So many thanks for that. This is the first UK initiative that I know of to consider the restoration of fungal diversity from a rewilding perspective. And after working together with Alan and with the other uh, members of the project to develop out bespoke uh, rewilding strategies for fungi, I'm pleased to say that this is the first nature recovery project in the UK to formally adopt the three F's terminology of flora, fauna and fungi. So as a side note, we'd love to create a press release around this. So if there's anyone out there who has experience in doing so uh, and who can help us out with getting something out there, please do get in touch. Now, much of what I've talked about in today's talk can be found in a book chapter that I co-authored with uh, Matt Wainhouse, who's a specialist in the translocation of threatened wood decay species of fungi. And this book chapter is part of the Routledge Handbook of Rewilding, put together by the IUCN Rewilding Thematic Group, and is going to be out on the 29th of November. So I'd like to send a massive thank you to Matt Wainhouse for helping shape my views on fungi and rewilding, and for helping to make the book chapter what it actually is. So very often, one of the reasons that I hear why fungi haven't received as much conservation attention is because they're not as warm and fuzzy and relatable or charismatic as iconic megafauna, such as bears, wolves, lynx and eagles. I have to disagree with that because anyone who's walked through an autumn woodland at the peak of mushroom season will know how marvelously charming and colorful and attention grabbing fungi can be, many of which are dripping with charisma. So every autumn, the landscape shows us what it's really made of, revealing for a brief few weeks the unseen connections that underpin our ecosystems. And it's about time that we start to see their importance and factor in their importance, reflecting that within our conservation and rewilding priorities. So with that said, thank you everyone for listening. If you want to find out more about the stuff that I do, do check out my website, rewildingmycology.org, as well as my Instagram page, uh, Rewilding Mycology, where I do uh, post on a regular basis. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, David, for this fascinating and inspiring talk, um, for all the talk of mushroom and fungi uh, inclusivity. 
Um, we really, really loved it. I saw lots of hearts from Juliana, uh, well, some of our COP members as well, other speakers. Um, so very well done. Thank you so much. Moving on uh, from David's presentation, um, the next presentation will be held by Michael Hadaway. So um, Michael, yeah, comes from a different kind of uh, background. So he's an anthropologist as well as a fungi specialist. Um, so yeah. I'll let you take the stage, Michael, and introduce yourself in a bit more detail. Uh, yeah, we're here and we'll listen to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm unmuted now, right? Okay. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here and be in conversation with David Athen, and thanks to all the organizers for putting everything together and the audience for being here. And one thing I wanted to say too, is that in terms of the place that I'm speaking from today, I have a, uh, a beautiful uh, map up of the land uh, around me, but I am uh, speaking from a city that's now called Vancouver and a country that's now called Canada. And it was just only a little bit more than 200 years ago that uh, Captain George Vancouver, who's a British sea captain, landed here. And that in that time since then, then there have never been any uh, treaties made or any um, battles fought in which the lands have been unceded. So I want to recognize the, the territory of the land that I'm on, which is still the unceded lands of three different major groups, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil -Waututh. And I've been watching this kind of uh, indigenous resurgence uh, happening over the last few decades and starting to kind of bridge my own interest in all things fungi that's mainly been uh, rooted in my studies in Southwest China and to learn about the deep relationships with fungi of, of the people living here. Yeah. and. It's interesting for me to be a cultural anthropologist here. I, I was thinking that, you know, it's just a few months ago that one of the organizers, Honas, asked me about speaking at today's event. And I, I said, oh, I think you must be misinterpreting my research goals. I, I'm not so interested to encourage people to use different fungi to accomplish their goals by, you know, we mentioned cleanup oil spills or digesting plastic or rewilding land and so forth, but I'm more interested in looking closely at various species of fungi to appreciate their forms of specific liveliness. So uh, Honas answered, oh, I, I think I know what you're interested in. I just finished your book. Um, I'd like you to add your point into the conversations about rewilding to think about what fungi are already doing in their daily lives even without our human interventions into making these places wild again. Um, so I thank you for, for being very inclusive to um, bring me in today. Um, so with that, I was happy to sign up to be part of this conversation. And i am been fascinated by rewilding, which often means a number of active and exciting experiments that are far beyond the laboratory walls. It's kind of like a complicated experiment where changing one variable, such as what David just mentioned, the removal of sheep, leads to all kinds of expected and unexpected consequences as various animals and plants and fungi and others all start to live different lives and maybe new species show up as well. So today I will draw a bit on my own book, which is, as you see uh, behind you, uh, called What a Mushroom Lives For, Matsutake Mushrooms and the Worlds They Make, and includes some other thoughts about this conversation. In this talk, I imagine that many of you came here because of the rewilding push, and I saw in the poll that many of you had an interest in both rewilding and fungi. And I know that fungi were also just their own intrinsic uh, force of attraction, and as David said, forms of charisma. So today I wanted to give some thoughts about shifting from an idea of other organisms as objects of human utility, as resources, or as commodities, and instead start to think more about our fellow beings as world makers, a concept I'll introduce. And I wonder how we might better recognize the presence and power of fungi all around us from this different perspective. So in doing the research for my book, I began with my training as a cultural anthropologist. 
I was part of this collaborative group called the Matsutake Worlds Research Group, and together we are writing a mushroom trilogy. My own book is the second one, and the first book called The Mushroom at the End of the World was written by Anna Singh. So this mushroom, the Matsutake, which is a kind of a firm, uh, white, mainly white mushroom that pops up in the fall and has this amazing, totally unique smell that's a little bit spicy, a little bit cinnamony. Uh, it turns out that it grows in many places in the world, but it's really in Japan and in second degree uh, Korea that people are incredibly passionate about this mushroom. It is so important to their sense of identity, to their sense of national citizenry, that when the Matsutake uh, numbers started to dwindle after World War II, the Japanese started to explore all around the world to, to find this mushroom and to, and to import it in. And so my own work with this project was to continue my work in Southwest China. And for those of you that are not familiar with this area, I'm mainly talking about a province called Yunnan that borders on Myanmar and Burma to the west and Laos and Vietnam to the south and then Tibet and Sichuan province to the north. So by the 1980s, especially because of the Japanese interest, this place became one of the most productive areas for one of the world's most valuable mushrooms, this Matsutake, which is Japanese for pine mushroom. And I would be working with ethnic Tibetan people who raised yaks and with ethnic E people who raised goats. And yet, as I was doing this field work, which included drinking a lot of yak butter tea and staying up late with E musicians, I started to think about these Matsutake mushrooms in a different way, inspired by what my hosts were telling me. So one day, a, a mushroom hunter described the ways that he was not the only hunter and how he noticed that there were several species of hunters who were better than him at finding these mushrooms. He asked how they observed and learned from each other, and I was intrigued to hear of a different way to think about insects' own liveliness. So returning home to Vancouver, I began to expand that interest in insect lives to inquire if there were Western scientific traditions that would help me to understand these better. I came across the fascinating work of an Estonian scientist from the turn of the century named Jakob van Uxkol. He started the study of what he called the Umwelt, which is German for environment. Uxkol was curious about how every species has its own perceptual universe. What it can perceive and thus know about is informed by its own perceptual capacities. So what it can see, hear, smell, and so forth. And he wanted to know about the umwelt of many species. So he did experiments with earthworms and jellyfish and starfish, among others, to understand their specific umwelts. But he almost exclusively focused on animals. And so I scoured the scientific literature for insights into the perceptual capacities of various fungal species and pieced together what I could find at the time. Uxkol's work is now a major part of what is called biosemiotics. Many of you will likely have heard of the field of semiotics, which means the production and interpretation of signs, uh, usually mean human spoken language or human body language or, or even written text. But if we instead switch it to biosemiotics, this refers to forms of communication that occur between any species, not just humans. I realized that previously, when I thought of forms of communication between non-humans, say between plants, I assumed that the signals would be clear. I, I had heard of the story of you know, the, the oak tree getting attacked by uh, certain insects and then that oak tree sending out chemical signals to other trees that then receive it and then they can uh, produce defensive chemicals like tannins. Um, so I assumed that this would be this kind of one chemical, one meaning relationship. But what I didn't realize was that many chemical signals are quite complex and that not only these individual signals are happening, but that everybody, many different plants and fungi and others are communicating all at once. Even when to our human noses, when we're going outside within our the umwelt of our scent, we don't realize that we smell anything, 
we have to realize that the air is often a thick soup of forms of chemical communication. And in turn, the survival of different species depends on them paying attention to this thick soup, paying attention to the signals that matter and filtering out what we might, if we want to mix metaphors a bit, call the noise that they don't need to listen to. And this was part of a much more active form of engagement with the world, um, which other species do that I describe in terms of world making. And here I thought I would read from a short passage of the book just for a few minutes about um, trying to think through about what this might mean, what this approach might mean, um, and about how they are actively engaged in making their worlds. So here, uh, in, the, in the middle of the book, I say, one way I've begun to conceptualize Matsutake in a more active way is to think of them as having three qualities. I started to appreciate that many species that have appeared on Earth are now extinct, and the very fact that Matsutake even exist in Yunnan province or anywhere else in the world is due to their actions as explorers, as relationship makers, and as performers. Such active terms are typically reserved for humans, but I think it is reasonable to imagine that fungi also possess and avail themselves of these qualities. Let me briefly rehearse a few points from the previous three chapters, which foregrounds Matsutake's active engagement with the world and world making. As explorers, they had to arrive in Yunnan, either by spore or by mycelium, the former by spore, requiring successfully launching themselves into space to catch the winds, or perhaps hitching a ride on animals that carried them. The latter, by mycelium, required traveling slowly over long periods of time. In order to arrive in new places, almost immediately upon germinating, the hyphae had to be expert relationship builders and adaptive in their actions. They needed to create these relationships quickly because they would not have long after their spores germinated to make these connections with trees. It is probable that the trees in Southwest China were different from, but similar enough to those found in the places these spores had traveled from. And here's just one um, brief caveat. We often would see in terms of books, the kinds of um, the relationships, mycorrhizal relationships between fungi and a certain set of trees, but we also have to kind of remember that over a long period of time, that these relationships are changing and growing, that the, that the fungi themselves are expanding and making new relationships with new trees. Thus, Matsutake learned how to form intimate semiotic and material relationships with different kinds of trees and roots, sharing and communicating by chemical compounds that are exchanged through the soil or in the air. So in what ways are Matsutake performers? The perspectives of this book is to move away from the common sense understanding of performance as a human only activity and as something consciously acted apart from everyday life on a stage for others to see. Instead, my understanding of the term performer is based on the social scientific concept that actions, all actions can be seen as a kind of performance. Scholars like Judith Butler, for example, argue that people live as gendered subjects in a million everyday performances that include how people dress, speak, walk, and talk. To be rendered as intelligibly gendered subjects requires meeting certain audience expectations. Extending this idea to a mushroom, we might see how Matsutake, like all forms of life, are always performing in relation to both living and non-living others. The performances include all of the many acts required for them to stay alive from day to day, finding new sources of food and water, mediating attacks from bacteria, insects, and others, exchanging nutrients with trees, and growing and dying. As well, to carry on the next generation, the fungi actively may be luring in insects, mammals, or birds to carry their spores to new realms, or by uh, shooting off their spores to repel them powerfully into swirling currents of air. Many of these actions are largely imperceptible to human umwelten, human umwelt, because mushrooms often move too slowly for humans to notice. Our time-lapse videos can reveal mushrooms as active and moving subjects that we do not usually see in motion with our limited perception and patience. 
They seem to pop into the air, unfurl their cap, and eject their spores. More difficult to see in their underground terrain, they are actively engaging. Their hyphae are slithering through the soil to explore. They are drinking up drops of water. They are drilling into grains of sand for their nutritious minerals. So here I will um, end the section there and just just in conclusion to say that part of what the book is trying to do is to see all of the active forms of, of fungi's everyday forms of living. And part of this, I think, is, as David's talk um, also addressed, is kind of not only moving away from a sense of fungi as forgotten, as either you know not observed or ignored or scorned, and instead, at even two, another level is trying to move away from a kind of enlightenment uh, legacy that many of us have inherited of Western science that has seen other species as mere machines, as, as really quite passive as compared to human activity. And then to, uh, by seeing all of these forms of action, the role of perception, the role of interpretation, of fungi and other beings to um, to see the the world and our fellow kin as much more alive than we are typically taught and typically um, told about. So thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Michael. That was um, yeah. If anything, transported us into a different, even though it is very much our universe as well, but. Uh, we sometimes, as you've um, pointed out, live quite separately from it. And I, it made me think of the work also of Glenn Albrecht, who you may or may not know, an Australian philosopher, who also engages in acts of world making, word making, um, and talks about the concept of symbiocene. So going from the Anthropocene into the symbiocene and how we can, like our fungi cousins, uh, live more in symbiosis. Um, with our environments. So thank you very much. Um, very much enjoyed that. Um, moving on to our third presentation um, from the lovely Bethan Manley. So Bethan is program manager at SPUN. Um, and SPUN stands for the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. And it is a nonprofit initiative that aims to map and understand and obviously also conserve underground microbial from their networks. So she will talk about that in more detail. And uh, yeah, over to you, Beth, and thanks so much. Okay, thank you. So I will share my screen. Is that all okay for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Okay, so. Yeah, firstly, thank you so much for having me. This has been a really amazing, uh, or this has been a really amazing session. And it's so amazing to see how many people there are um, present because, yeah, I was not expecting this when, when we were invited to talk. It's really cool. Um, so as we, as we said, I'm Bethan and I work for the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks or SPUN. Um, and at SPUN, we have we have this kind of overarching ambition, this this kind of key concept, which is to protect the underground. Uh, and what that means to us at SPUN is to basically protect a particular type of mycorrhizal fungi. So we're really interested in the mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and these mycorrhizal fungi are, are as we've heard today from, from David, um, these are these fungi that engage in symbiotic interactions with plants uh, and they form incredible underground extensive networks in the soil. So it's really amazing at the moment that fungi are getting so much attention from the public and the media. And finally, this seems to be translating to some protections to fungal species. But at SPUN, we'd probably still argue that when it comes to understanding organisms and conserving them, there's still a bit of an above ground bias. Um, and there's such a focus on organisms that we can see and quantify easily, even when it comes to fungi, uh, we may not be fully considering some really crucial components of a he healthy planet when we overlook organisms that we can't always see. So really, there's a bias toward protecting and often caring for species that are highly visible to us. And at SPAN, of course, one of the things we want to do is to overturn this above ground bias. 
But before I go into how we're approaching this, I'll just talk a little bit about these fungi that we're so interested in that can mostly be found below the ground. So as I mentioned earlier, mycorrhizal fungi form symbiotic associations with plants. Um, this symbiosis looks something like this. Uh, this is an image of a small ecosystem of plants and their associated hyphal networks that I took from a recent New York Times article uh, that was produced about spun. Um, and it was a really great article. So if you haven't seen it already, I really encourage everybody to, to check that out. It's really good. And this is a nice image uh, because it's it's a good demonstration of the mycorrhizal symbiosis in showing how these fungal threads, which are shown in purple here, they form this amazing out of sight network in the soil. And these fungi are excellent, really excellent foragers. So they actually are better than the plant roots themselves very often uh, in foraging. And they help the, the plants to explore the soil. They help them to explore for water and for nutrients. And sometimes they, they even do this to a point where the plants are getting a majority of their nutrients and water from their fungal partners and, and not actually from their root foraging capacity. So the plants can get a little bit lazy. Uh, and the mycorrhizal fungi don't do all of this foraging and, and providing plants with nutrients for free. Fungi are kind of like us. They, they need to eat the products of, of photosynthesis. So they need to eat the carbon that, that plants are producing. But these mycorrhizal fungi don't, don't do this by farming plants like we do. They do it by living in really, really close contact with plants and trading with them to get this carbon. And what you can't see in this image is that the fungi physically live inside the root systems of their plant partners. And they form these amazing exchange, exchange structures, uh, which is where they swap their soil nutrients for carbon from the plant. And the networks that mycorrhizal fungi form really underpin terrestrial life on earth as I mean we've heard a little bit about that well quite a lot about today and obviously this sounds like quite a big claim but really the organisms that you see in a natural environment so the trees the invertebrates that uh, the mammals they're all supported by this the presence of this underground network of mycorrhizal fungi and these fungi kind of face a, a bit of a thankless task because despite their importance in ecosystems and despite the fact that they've been playing this critical role for really over a billion years, they are hidden from our sight in the soil. And so it's quite difficult for us to see and to understand their contributions. However, there are some ways that we can see them. Well, we can see these mycorrhizal networks. And here I'm showing a short video of mycorrhizal hyphae. Um, what you're looking at is a flow of information and of resources. And it's a, basically it's a it's a living network in the soil. Um, and this has been imaged thanks to a collaboration between AMOLF, the Biophysics Institute in, in Amsterdam, and the lab of Toby Kiers, who is one of the founders of SPUN. This image isn't sped up. So it's an incredibly complex and dynamic system and it's really extensive. So we know that these networks can make up around 50 percent of the living biomass of soils, um, well, of the soils where they're present. And there are kilometers of these networks under our feet all of the time. And we still don't fully understand what they're doing. So when we think about mycorrhizal fungi, there are two main types to consider. So the ectomycorrhizal fungi include these really well-known fruiting body forming fungi like Amanita muscaria, uh, which is our very charismatic fly agaric. But for a vast majority of the life cycles of these organisms, uh, of these ectomycorrhizal fungi, they're mostly under the ground. So when you see a fruiting body, it's really just the tip of the iceberg of the fungal form that is below the ground. And the other mycorrhizal fungi that we should consider are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and they never form fruiting bodies. So they, they don't make any above ground structures. They live out their whole lives under the ground and they look something like this, this image that I'm showing here, um, which is this network of, of their hyphae. Uh, the really remarkable thing about all mycorrhizal fungi really is that this amazing connective structure that looks something like this, um, this is their body. So this is their, their structure, this is their form. Um, so they really are their living networks. And this is such an interesting thing to consider when we talk about rewilding and restoration, because even the ectomycorrhizal fungi that we can sometimes see very occasionally, um, they still spend most of their lives um, below ground, even though very occasionally we see them in the above ground. 
So they're invisible to us for a majority of their lives. Um, and they're doing all this essential work for ecosystems where we can't see them. So it's very difficult for us to monitor how our ways of living and managing land uh, impacts them when we can't measure them and see them. And unfortunately, of course, as is the case with so many organisms on Earth right now, the areas where these essential mycorrhizal networks exist are being severely degraded. So we're losing so many biomes where these fungi operate. And with their loss, we're really losing crucial components of natural ecosystems. Um, and not only would the loss of these mycorrhizal networks destabilize entire ecosystems, these fungi are also a major carbon sink. So when their plant pass partners pass them carbon, these fungi, um, they store it in the soil. And we know that billions of, of tons of carbon flows annually from, from plants to fungal networks. Um, so when we measure things like deforestation and the impact that this has on climate change, what in adding carbon back to the atmosphere, we actually also really need to know how much carbon is being released by the destruction of these, these soil uh, fungal networks as well. So now on to SPUN. Um, SPUN is a non-profit science initiative, and it was founded to map mycorrhizal communities and to advocate for their protection and conservation. So the idea for SPUN originated with Toby Keyes here, who you can see uh, sampling some soil there uh, underneath a very old tree. I think Juliana was also probably there at this point. Um, and Toby is a professor of evolutionary ecology at the Free University of Amsterdam. Toby has been working tirelessly to work out how underground fungal networks operate. And she funded SPUN due to this need to understand and conserve these networks. So now we have this really marvelous team of people working towards this aim. And we've actually been growing recently and we have even more amazing team members than are present in this picture here. So how is SPUN working on this concept of overturning our above ground biases in the conservation of biodiversity? Well, we know that there are these above ground biodiversity hotspots where we have incredible forms and species and interactions like in the Amazon, um, which obviously has this incredible concentration of above ground biodiversity. But where are our examples of underground biodiversity hotspots? So where is the Amazon of the underground? <laughs> we want to identify which ecosystems, which regions, which soils, um, which parts of the world contain incredible mycorrhizal biodiversity. And we want to see whether our areas of, of high concentrations of below ground biodiversity actually match up with what we see above ground. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we're trying to, to do this and identify these hotspots. Since we can't easily see them, of course, we have to search for our mycorrhizal networks in the soil. So scientist, uh, scientists, when they, when they do this type of work, they collect soil samples uh, from regions of interest. They send them to a lab and they sequence the DNA that was that's found in these samples. And the DNA sequences then tell them which mycorrhizal groups and species are in the different locations that we've we've tested and sampled in. But the team at SPUN are not really the ones who'll be doing most of this sampling. Uh, we're forming sort of a network of researchers across the globe in an imitation of the fungal uh, networks that we study. And what we want to do with that, uh, with this amazing network that we're forming, uh, is we want to sort of help build capacity in areas of the world where the, the species of fungi in the soils are undescribed. So we want to support mycorrhizal researchers in this area to carry out research in their biomes of interest, especially since there are so many amazing scientists out there already studying mycorrhizal networks. And so we support our research community with common protocols with collaborations and by providing grant funding and mm. recently we had an amazing grant call mm. for the launch of our uh, underground explorers program um, this is a program that provides grants to fund mycorrhizal uh, sampling uh, led by the researchers and we are prioritizing funding here for researchers from underrepresented groups in science and from areas where we have a lack of data. And we had just an amazing amount of, of applications from some really incredible scientists and locations across the world. So this is super exciting. Um, 
So as well as our grant recipients being able to carry out their own questions on the ecology and the biology of mycorrhizal fungi in the areas of the world that they care about and they study, this program has the additional benefit of adding more data on mycorrhizal distributions in, um, into our collective understanding. So then what do we do with this data? So at SPUN, we're really in the business of making maps, uh, in the map business. We're partnered with a database that has gathered all of the current existing DNA sequence data on where fungi, well, where all fungi are over the world. And Spun and our associated scientists have been able to use this DNA sequence data on which mycorrhizal fungi exist where, uh, as well as using additional data such as vegetation types and climate variables. Um, and they're able to predict mycorrhizal biodiversity across the globe. Mm. So these maps are predicting where we may have hotspots of mycorrhizal diversity um, and mycorrhizal fungi. So this here that I'm showing is a prediction map for one of the two main types of mycorrhizal fungi that I mentioned. So this is for the ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, these tend to be located in forests. Um, their preferred hosts are often trees. So you can see the map predicts high biodiversity indicated by these lighter colors and it, it sort of matches what we would expect for this type of fungus. And so we have these predictions and now at SPUN, what we're really focused on is improving the accuracy of these predictions as well. So we are working toward collecting more data, which is, is in part why we have these, these grant calls and, and why we want to expand where we have data, um, because there's also so much we, we still don't know and so many places where the mycorrhizal diversity hasn't been explored. And then when we can measure and predict where different fungal networks are concentrated and which fungi are present where, we can start to predict the way this biodiversity will change under climate change, which is, of course, a really important thing to consider. Um, we also want to be able to understand what the presence of different fungal species and groups tells us in terms of the functionality of the ecosystem. For example, different mycorrhizal fungi have different traits. So there are lots and lots of different species. Um, and some may be very, very good at helping their plant partners to survive drought conditions, which is, of course, really, really important to know. Um, others are particularly good at carbon sequestration. And again, that's very important to know. We, we want to know where all of these, these um, fungi with their different amazing traits are and how we can conserve them. And that, of course, brings you on to this slide. So knowing which fungi are where will really give us a better idea of priorities, because what we really want is to understand these networks to protect them. We want to know which networks in which locations are in trouble, um, which ones are particularly vulnerable. We need to consider both the above ground and the below ground, essentially, when we're implementing conservation and restoration practices. And I guess it, it sort of goes without saying that in order to maintain healthy ecosystems, we need to be paying attention to the maintenance of soil structure and health. And of course, a huge amount of this is considering the organisms that live in the soil and make it what it is. So the microbiome of the soil, which includes fungi, is really a, a life support system for the planet that we want to protect. We have evidence already that there has been a reduction in the number of observed mushroom forming fungi, at least um, across Europe. But we don't know what this translates to below ground. We need to be able to look at what above ground reduction in invisible fungi is, is telling us about the extent of loss of underground networks. Um, and this is important in, in attempts, of course, to restore or rewild line, landscapes. There's also a lot of discussion around doing things like soil transplants, which is super interesting. Mm. And this is the concept of bringing soil from healthy ecosystems to degraded areas. And the idea is really that not only are you moving soil, you're, of course, moving the microbes and fungi in that soil to help restore the below ground aspects of the degraded ecosystem that you want to um, improve. And this is a super interesting concept, and it, it will really really be helped by furthering our understanding of soil systems and fungal networks in general. If we lose soil symbionts like fungi uh, from ecosystems, then it's going to make rewilding or restoration practices even more challenging if our below ground ecosystems aren't restored too. So this brings me on to the final slide. Um, just a huge thanks to the whole SPUN team, not all of which are in this image, of course, um, as well as our many partners, again, not all of which are displayed here. 
um, everybody here has been instrumental in sharing data, in, produce, in producing the prediction maps of fungal biodiversity, working with us on sampling trips, and much, much more. Um, and lastly, please do check out our website for how to be more involved with SPUN. We'd love to hear from you all. Um, it'll keep you up to date on our work and have a look at some of the media that has been released, uh, especially recently, that focuses on SPUN. We have some, we've had some really interesting coverage. And yeah, another big thank you to the organizers. It's been really great to talk, take part today. And I'll stop sharing with that. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Bethan. Um, that was very fascinating and a great conclusion to the three um, talks we have had so far. And obviously, you've really pointed out the link as to why it's so important to map these underground networks in order to accurately be able to know what's there, make them known, um, and also be able to yeah, uh, restore ecosystems. So thank you very much for that. That was fascinating. Um, yeah, so we've had our three wonderful presentations, um, move, moving on to the moderated discussions. So we've had a few of our community members uh, take note of the questions that you've posted in the chat box. Um, perhaps if you have any um, that you haven't shared so far, um, yeah, feel free to do so now and we'll try our best to answer them. Um, yeah. So as a first question, uh, Sky Miller had asked, um, yeah, to know more about how um, how hard rot fungi increase the stability of ancient mm. trees. Yeah. So cool. Perhaps... Yeah, I can dive in for that. Yeah. <clears throat> so that comment that I made. Uh, mentioned there in the talk that is based off of a stipulation that was posited by um a guy called ted green amazing guy um works in the arboricultural slash a little bit in mycological space um and has some uh pretty interesting talks on youtube as well if you want to check that out so the idea here is is that as a tree gets older imagine all of that um heavy wood that is starting to accumulate above the ground raising up the center of gravity of that tree making it uh, as as the tree gets bigger and assuming there's no heart rot that's happening inside of the tree its center of mass is rising higher and higher and higher and therefore whenever there's any kind of extreme weather events such as a storm it increases its chances of actually toppling down in that storm now, what happens as a tree ages is that not only does it get shorter and kind of wider, um, and I'm talking specifically about oaks here, for example. Um, so if you imagine the progression that an oak experiences once it um, starts to age, it shoots up, it becomes a nice big maiden tree, but then as it starts to age, it starts to retract some of its energy from the crown. You might get kind of a crown tipped um, oak where there's no and it starts to get wider and wider and wider but it doesn't actually get any taller so that's why you see kind of some of the most ancient oaks being very squat in their appearance um now what's happening as the tree reaches its second half of its life is that you tend to get you know cracks and fissures start to appear as well as you know different latent fungi that would have been present in the sapwood uh, start to decompose some of that heartwood now um, which is more of the central column of the wood itself and what that does is it essentially um reduces the mass of the tree lowers that center of gravity back down again so that it's essentially more stable and um, secure against uh, different extreme weather events so it's kind of a combination of the tree getting smaller itself as well as reducing the mass inside of it too um, so you can hear a lot more about that um, if you go on youtube and search for talks by either ted green or lynn body as well they do some joint talks there as well which is um, absolutely fantastic and as a tree nerd myself you know i, I enjoy all three hours of each every talk that comes out okay thank you very much david for answering that question um Another question that we'd had relatively early on, so it might be for you as well, David, or for Michael, um, which was what opportunities might there be for amateur mycologists to help with data gathering? Actually, that might be more uh, for you as well, Bethan. Um, yeah, anyone who feels 
Cool. Qualified I'm happy to, to yeah. start off with that. Um, best thing to do is join your local recording group. So the whole of the UK is has many different uh, local fungus recording groups. So my one, or my two local ones are actually the Scottish Borders Group and the Edinburgh and Lothians Fungus Enthusiasts. There's going to be some place in the UK, if you're based in the UK, that is. Um, to find a group of people who are committed to you know learning about fungi and exploring field mycology identification skills and things like that and also contributing to actual recording especially of um, under recorded areas in the uk which then get uploaded on, onto publicly accessible databases um, and then contributes to our knowledge base um so that'll be the first recommendation there for sure um and if if you're a university student there's lots of university societies that are coming up that are specifically for focused on uh, field mycology and just, you know, starting to dabble around in that. But yeah, that, that would be my first suggestion. I don't know if Michael or Bethan has any other um, ideas around that. Sure, I'd be happy to jump in. I also just wanted to say uh, thanks, David, for that explanation too around the tree Halloween. And I think that just to say one more thing about that, that this shows a kind of fundamental shift in assuming that Fungi are pathogenic, are always in the process of, you know, creating diseases or killing trees. That was the normal kind of expectation when one saw fungi growing out of trees. And so to even rethink that that may enable certain larger trees to stay upright longer was represents a kind of fundamental mental shift in how to think about those relations. So, you know, kudos to that original kind of movement, that that pivot. Um, just in terms of amateur mycology, it's a great question. And I, I do feel like of many disciplines, mycology is incredibly receptive to amateurs and amateurs have played a very prominent role and even one of the most fundamental, you know, textbooks um, that's kind of become global in a way. It's called Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora. It's written by an amateur mycologist and that exactly as David says, you know, getting together with with groups, uh, mycology groups is fabulous. There's also um, two for those of you either in groups or out of groups. There's an app called iNaturalist that allows uh, free crowd sharing of information. So you know, people don't always put their favorite morel or chanterelle mushroom spots up, up on there to share with everybody, but it is a great way to keep track of what kinds of fungi are appearing and disappearing and for people to start to get a better sense of of larger trends or you know sometimes there are these surprising movements right where um you'll have uh certain weather conditions that will mean fungi will jump south or north hundreds of kilometers um in a given year and so that's a great way to kind of keep track of that and share that with others and bethann i don't know if you had anything else yeah, so so we again Spun finds that we have just such an incredible motivated community of people who are interested. It's it's so cool to see. Um and of course it's a little bit more difficult for us sometimes um when considering something like a citizen a science citizen science approach because we have you know we have to we have to use soil and a lot of the time we have to do DNA extractions and sequencing to see what what's there. Um Sorry, I thought I froze then. Um, but we're we're very very interested in in producing a, a citizen science program. Uh, this is something we're really looking into, um, and and until that's that's something that we have up and running, we're really just interested in hearing from people. So we have our spun newsletter, which I'd really recommend uh, um, signing up for because it, it'll it tells you about all of the really amazing things that spun's up to um and then you'll you'll hear as soon as we have something up and running for for citizen scientists and and um people in general so yeah that would be really great to to have you all on board okay thank you somehow i've been uh, put on full screen um apologies for everyone who has to look at my face um, yeah, if it's possible um, to share the presentation in the background, that would be great. Um, but yeah, moving on to another question. Thank you very much for your insightful answers. Um, Alan Watson Featherstone um, asked a very specific question. I'll try my best to read it out correctly. Um, so he says, um, the map of ecto ectop mycorrhizal diversity is the highest. And it appears to indicate that conifer forests are the ecosystems with the greatest 
diversity. Um, and he wonders why that is. <laughs> so, so, yeah. oops, sorry, is, is this is this about the, the spun map? Is that the, the question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, well, so as I mentioned, that that was just for ectomycorrhizal species, right? So, so what it, it's finding is these really intact, mainly temperate forests are the ones where we have this really high diversity um, of ectomycorrhizal species. If you looked at a different map, so for the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, you'd see really something completely different because they're not the, the types of, of fungi that tend to associate with trees. So what you're seeing on that map is where the, the where the, the really strong concentration of ectomycorrhizal diversity. Um, and by that, we mean uh, a kind of a higher concentration of, of different species. So a um, high community of ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, tends to be in these areas where there are a large forests where there are all of these trees which are their preferential hosts so yeah i mean they they, they will tend to be things like con conifer forests this is yeah exactly it i could chip in um <clears throat> with a bit of an explanation why that might be as well if you want to know alan um so mycorrhizal fungi have adapted to different latitudes based on the kinds of rates of nutrient turnover within the soil. So if you think about the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that tend to occupy the tropics and the kind of um, mid latitudes where you tend to have a lot of grassland ecosystems, what you have there is very high turnover rates of nutrients within the soil so that bacteria and other soil microbes are constantly turning over uh, the organic matter, which uses up a lot of the nitrogen, but then the limiting nutrient, the growth limiting nutrient in those ecosystems is actually phosphorus, which are buscular mycorrhizal fungi are pre-adapted to specifically channel and uptake and then pass on to the, the plants themselves. Whereas as we start to creep higher towards the northern latitudes, when you get these kind of large boreal forests and temperate forest ecosystems, it, they're a lot colder which means that the rates of organic matter turnover within the soil are a lot slower. Um, and in those cases, it's the nitrogen that's the limiting nutrient for the growth of the plants, which ectomycorrhizal fungi are pretty good at uptaking. So you tend to see that the ectomycorrhizal fungi have that um, preferential bias towards nitrogen uptake, whereas our buscular mycorrhizal fungi have more of a, a preference towards phosphorus uptake. But of course, there's a lot of blurred lines between the two because you get also a lot of ectomycorrhizal uh, fungi within, you know, the eucalypt forests in Australia where, you know, phosphorus is actually the, the growth limiting nutrient. So this is quite a broad brushstroke. But um, if you want to learn a bit more about that, um, there is David Reed who did a lot of research on this back in the 90s. He's kind of like the lead researcher on mycorrhizal fungi that, that um, explained a lot of this. And he actually put together a map that's very similar, very kind of rudimentary for what Spun is actually piecing together. Kind of just broadly showing like this is the ectomycorrhizal region of the world and this is the arbuscular mycorrh mycorrhizal region of the, of the world. So hope that kind of cleared things up a little bit there as well. Yeah, I think um, everyone's quite happy with the answer so far. So thank you, David, and everyone else for contributing. Um, another question that was um, that is actually more directed towards uh, Bethan. Um, it's a question about your research process at Spun. So how intrusive is it? Essentially, does the analysis that you perform disturb the mycorrhizae you're recording, or is it very kind of non-intrusive and uh, yeah, doesn't interfere with them being there essentially yeah so it's an important question of course so uh we have really rigorous uh at spun we have really rigorous non-intrusive sampling protocols um we, we of course don't don't want to harm the the um the networks at all or disturb the networks and we're able to to detect uh, mycorrhizal fungi from a pretty shallow amount of soil. You know, we don't have to go way down in the soil. Uh, it's just kind of like you were, as if you were digging a, a very shallow, small hole. Um, and we also, we don't really need to, to do a lot of different, you know, holes all over the place. Um, that would that would make it a lot of work to to do a kind of global mapping campaign. It would be really difficult. So we are only able to actually um, assess sort of a few a few soil samples per kilometer. Um, 
well it, yeah we we have an aim to to sort of sequence to so to sort of analyze mycorrhizal fungal biodiversity in every pixel of the planet which would be a square a square kilometer but of course that's not what we're doing right now because we have so so many pixels of the planet when you divide it up into square kilometers and we have only so many people to, to do this work so um we're not yeah we're not making loads and loads of holes everywhere and we have a, a very non-intrusive um sampling protocol but it, yeah it's a great question it's very important to make sure we're not disturbing the networks yeah amazing glad to hear that um there's another question for you and that is you know um amy asked that um well she asked about um when trying to switch the focus away from only the things that we can see um you know, would you hope to see in a future that more focus is being given to mycorrhizal fungi when surveys are being conducted or, yeah, um, perhaps when soil samples are being taken? Um, I, I would take that your answer would be yes to this question, but perhaps you have anything to, to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, of, of course, even when people do soil, uh, soil studies, so even when people are are uh, assessing the, the soil health a lot of the time they're not always looking at mycorrhizal fungi because there are so many interesting things in the soil there's nematodes there's loads and loads and loads of bacteria so I think that's another thing that Spun is super interested in is is really pushing even soil science and and soil scientists and there are a, quite a lot of global mapping um, consortia and and efforts to to look at soil health and we just we, yeah we want we want mycorrhizal um, science and we want mycorrhizal fungi to be measured in all of these efforts so yes a big a big push for studying mycorrhizal fungi and assessing them everywhere mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one of the ways of doing that, obviously, is also to have support from policymakers. Um, so actually, this is a question that I would like to ask. And um, yeah, it refers to whether you feel like, um, you know, policymakers are and, and people kind of shaping environmental policy, whether they are taking um, mushrooms and fungi more into conservation these days or whether they're still lagging behind um, in this day and age. Anyone that's specifically targeted to? Anyone who feels they know, maybe you, David, yeah. Well, I could chip in a little bit. Um, so I think with initiatives such as the three Fs initiative, flora, fauna, fungi, um, that is definitely going to start shifting the policy landscape simply because if it brings it into our language, then it makes it explicit, it makes it a lot more real for us. Um, and then that's going to trickle into eventually the 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 policy makers and the decision makers especially when you get good press coverage like what spun has been having uh for sure but i think that the kinds of policies that we've seen in the last kind of 20 30 years or so are going to be very different than the ones that are coming up right now especially when you have things like you know biodiversity markets coming out where there's going to be credits being developed based on you know different biodiversity metrics that are being monitored here in the uk that's that is um starting to be trialed now with what's known as a policy called biodiversity net gain where developers on different projects are expected to demonstrate at least a 10 percent uplift in biodiversity whenever there's some kind of um, development that wants to be made or some kind of land use change um, and currently the, the metrics that are being used the algorithms that are being used to assess the state of an ecosystem and its biodiversity value don't actually include fungi mm -hmm. um and I'm, I guess that is simply to do with the fact that they're very hard to monitor and then there aren't actually any standardized ways of monitoring fungi because fruit body surveys can only show you what's you know actively reproducing in that given year. It doesn't say, say anything about the, the, the mycelium and the vegetative growth underground and the species that could be found there and the ones that don't even produce fruit bodies. Um, whereas eDNA analysis, so actually sampling the fungi in the soil, um, might pick up spores it might pick up unmated mycelia but it might not pick up mature mycelia that are capable of reproduction so there's no really any standardized method and that's why it's kind of been left out um, from these metrics that are evolving but i see them you know future iterations of the metrics and different algorithms that are used for this kind of stuff um there should be some kind of a, a, an upwards pressure especially given how in the uk you know the the, gov the government body so defra um, the, the Department for the Environment and Farming and Rural Affairs or something like that. Um, 
they have in the same report that they kind of demonstrated this this new metric that they're using for demonstrating biodiversity uplift um they themselves have mentioned that fungi are the most threatened taxonomic group in the uk so there is a precedent as well there's a recognition um so i definitely do see some kind of progress being made towards that how long it's going to take i'm not sure um but i think it's going to look very different than what it has in the last 20 years yeah, amazing. Thank you, David. Um, we have so many other questions. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What does everyone think? Should we keep going uh, with the questions? Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question? <laughs> yeah, last question, I think. Um, yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I lost you there. Um, one question was in terms of kind of... Um, yeah, direct practical actions. What are common daily practices that we as kind of, yeah, just perhaps not people who work directly in the field can carry out? Um, so one of the things that you never mentioned was walking through the woods or in their own backyard. Um, how can we encourage being at one and kind of feeling the presence of mushrooms and um, their diversity. Is there any kind of action that is similar to planting seeds and caring for young plants that we can do with, with mushrooms? So it's a more spiritual and I think one of consciousness um, questions. So yeah, perhaps Michael, um, you want to answer that one? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, one of the things too, it's like people think of about walking in the woods, but um, even just for myself living in a city, uh, I always had noticed these little splotches on the, the concrete sidewalks. And for many years, I just thought it was some kind of, you know, stain of gum or something like that. I had no idea that it was, there were lichens basically everywhere all over. And so part of it is just this kind of opening up one's senses to all of the fungi that's not just the big fruiting ones like the fly agarix in the fall, but are constantly around us. And that we are just thinking that we are kind of consuming the same oxygen that they are also consuming like us, um, that every breath that we've ever breathed in our life is one that has fungal spores in it, that that's always been our life, that they are omnipresent and they are you know shaping everything around us and starting to to notice them in terms of even the diversity within our homes and not moving away from a more view of them as potential pathogens or kind of matter out of place to realizing that they are everywhere and always have been some of our close um critical life partners for making the the planet livable is is a really um I think yeah. a different way to view it. Definitely, Michael. And I think, um, well, I said it was the last question. I have a tiny little last question to ask you, um, which made me, I mean, I thought about it because you mentioned pathogens, like how we view fungi as pathogens, but actually the true pathogens, I would say are humans and their um, destructive activities. <laughs> um, so one question that Alison had was, um, she's curious about the uh, reduction and disappearance of the most important fun uh, fungi in Japan post-World War II, and whether that was due to the toxic exposure um, introduced into mm. the environment. And I think mm. uh, someone else also asked about fertilizer, obviously these are known to destroy soil quality as well. So yeah. Perhaps you would want to quickly answer that question. Sure. Yeah, there are actually a few, a few variables that 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 shape this in such a tragic way in Japan. But one of the things that they noticed um, by the 70s and 80s, they started to pinpoint the role of um, coal-based uh, industry in China, and then that that playing uh, polluting the the air and causing the acidification. And so it was interesting that that was then harming the pine trees that were sustaining Matsutake, making them more vulnerable to nematodes uh, that were also hurting the trees. But one thing that Japan did is to kind of, it was some of the early days of noticing these international movements of acid rain. And then they went to start to offer uh, support for the industries in China to try to figure out how to clean up the smokestacks to, to reduce this, to both improve local pollution in China, but also to 
make the make the forest in Japan a bit more healthy for the matsutake mushroom. So it's an interesting way to, I think, of thinking about how we kind of slowly unravel these these complex international relations and then to think about forms of responsibility or relationship um, that that may be possible through that. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Um, and Susanna has uh, to leave. So um, some people are starting to leave. That will just bring me to kind of the last bit of um, today's event. Um, as mentioned earlier, we'll have a small breakout session for networking. Um, this is also when the YouTube kind of stream will end as um, no active participation is possible for those people. Um, but yeah, so everyone who'd like to stay on and kind of use this time for a bit of networking post this very interesting uh, discussion is free to stay. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. For